40 years. Man, it's been a seriously long time ever since the name Donkey Kong has been imprinted on gaming history. Ever since the original arcade game back in 1981, DK has become one of Nintendo's most recognizable characters, and his media reach went up far. From games of all kinds, to guest appearances in Mario games, to guest appearances in other games and movies, to... Whatever the CGI cartoon was. What? I'm sure most people are familiar with this character, but for people who have known him for a while, the Donkey Kong Country games are among the first that come to mind, and understandably so. They helped establish a sense of identity that most people know this A for today, and in general, they're some of the most highly placed platformers for the Super Nintendo. And knowing that console, that's saying a lot. And so for this anniversary, I decided to pick these games up and check them to see if they held up over the course of time. We've got the original Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Country 2 Diddy's Conquest, and Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. I felt covering these was the most appropriate for DK's anniversary, compared to something like covering the two modern games, though I still would like to look at those eventually, and it's much easier to marathon these three and do one single video rather than three separate ones, thanks to their relatively short length, even when completing them. So, guess it's time to see what good still lies within them. So starting with how the trilogy was conceived, Donkey Kong was only known for his arcade hits for quite a long time, while some other Nintendo franchises like Mario were flourishing. Not a whole lot else about him got people's attention back then, so Nintendo decided to give the task of bringing a fresh perspective to the series to Rareware, who you may recognize as the studio behind the games they made after the DKC trilogy, like Banjo-Kazooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day. Rare only had a team of 12 people and only 18 months to make the game, using whatever resources they had with their new Celicon graphics computers. Wait. Silicon no! Yeah, even with a good amount of money and higher up devs and Nintendo contributing ideas, Rare had their work cut out for them. But it all paid off when they released the game in 1994 to widespread acclaim, selling around 9.3 million copies and gaining a lot of popularity within the gaming market. So in a way, Donkey Kong Country has a ton of importance to the legacy of Rare and Nintendo. And then we get to today, where the game has held up very nicely. Yeah, this game is still really good! For a game with this task, and for implementing some rather simple ideas, right down to the story being, go give some crocodiles and their villainous king, K. Rule, whatever slapping they deserve for stealing a horde of bananas, they absolutely took advantage of that and delivered a really strong platformer. At surface level, both Donkey Kong and his little buddy Diddy Kong can run, jump, roll, and pick up items to throw at enemies. But there's plenty here that gives them some style to call their own. Donkey Kong isn't as fast as many other 2D platforming characters, but his weight is enough to uncover some secrets and beat particular enemies like Clumps and Crushes. His roll and jump can be chained together for extra mobility, the fact that you can do it over pits with good timing is a way of proving this, and the grabbing objects is used for various puzzles to find bonus rooms and make certain levels easier. I mean, you could do this with steel barrels. All this applies to Diddy too, but he is a bit faster and not as strong, so he's the more ideal choice for some platforming challenges. Both do have their uses, and the fact you can switch on the fly is very welcome, because you only need to make good use of them for what the game throws at you. I wouldn't say the game is gut-punchingly difficult, but the challenge can sneak up on you when you least expect it to. Both Kongs can only take one hit before losing a life, although having both characters on you does mean you have two hit points to work with. While lives are here, they're really easy to get, as some will reward you with a lot of them for taking specific routes, or by getting 100 bananas, which are this game's equivalent to coins from Mario. Just don't be surprised if you end up in situations where you lose a lot of them. Despite this, I really enjoy most of these levels. For how linear they can be, they always stick to the point they want to get across and have challenges that vary in terms of trickiness to figure out, yet feel rewarding to clear. Even though there are plenty of themes shared throughout the worlds, there's always something they do that sets them apart, making each one feel fresh. In one jungle level, you could be hopping around trying to see what routes you can take, while in another, you could be sticking to the treetops swinging around. In one cave level, you could be using your frog buddy Winky to make perilous jumps, while in another, you could be teaming up with a parrot named Squawks to navigate in the dark. In the mines, you could be riding in a minecart in one level, and in another, you could be avoiding the glowing red eyes. It gets to a point where if you drop a level's name, I'd probably be able to describe something about it. That's how distinct they are, which I appreciate. Actually, on that note, let's talk about one aspect that pops up from time to time. The Animal Buddies. These can be found in some of the levels, and they give you another control style. 
there's Rambi who can bulldoze anything in front of him, Espresso who can run very fast and glide, which can be used to find secrets, the previously mentioned Winky who can jump super high, Unquarity who controls much better underwater than the Kongs do, and can actually get past enemies in those levels, and finally Squawks, who's only in one level as a source of light. These do a great job shaking up the core gameplay, and discovering secrets with them feels rewarding, compounded by the fact that these technically aren't needed to finish the game, they're just there if you want to use them. I mentioned secrets a lot, so it's time to discuss one thing you'll remember in these levels. The bonus rooms, which are smaller sections of the level where you complete a short challenge and be rewarded with an item like an extra life, a bunch of bananas, one of level's four hidden Kong letters, which also give you an extra life if you manage to find them all, or an animal token, which through your specific animal buddy can let you access a different bonus room that's good for life grinding. Honestly, I really like looking for bonus rooms, as a lot of them are like puzzles within a level. They do give you some hints as to where a lot of them are, and the aha moments you get just by finding some of them are great to experience. Granted, I think some of them are a little too cryptic, and some levels go overboard with them, especially Orangu Chen Group, which has five of these things, and the means that they're hidden behind are just dumb, like espresso gliding under a level where it's easy to get back on, or jumping with a barrel on what looks like a bottomless pit, and choosing a wall to throw that barrel at. Twice for that matter. Though instances like this are the exception, rather than the norm. Most of the time, a good eye will be enough to spot most of them. All this would make for a great adventure, but it's enhanced by how this game is overall presented. As in, these visuals have held up very well. For 1994, the graphics of this game are darn near groundbreaking, and I still think they look really pretty. I love how well they translated SGI computer models into Super Nintendo sprites, complete with a lot of personality to boot. The backgrounds are so vibrant and detailed, acting as a great accomplice to the level themes, and certain effects like the different weather or the time of day changing the further you go through in a level are just mind-blowing. They went all in with the music too. I heard renditions of some of these songs in other games, but hearing the original versions felt just as good with the catchy beats and beautiful sounding instruments they had. I'm sure you know a lot of these. DK Jungle Swing, Aquatic Ambiance, Life in the Mines, Forest Frenzy, and oh yeah, Gangplank Galleon. This is a great soundtrack. So yeah, I've definitely complimented a lot out of a game from nearly 30 years ago. But even so, there are a couple snags. I went over how some bonus rooms are way too cryptic for my liking earlier, but the reason why I'm not big on it is because bonus rooms are tied to completion. All you have to keep track of them is a potential exclamation mark next to a level's name saying you got them. There is no indication as to how many there are, the game doesn't have so close to some of them, and Cranky's hints aren't even that helpful, which makes 100%ing this game harder for the wrong reasons. Not helped by backtracking to different worlds being locked behind an option to fly with Funky Kong. He's not always available when you need him to be, and sometimes he's not available until the second half of a world. This wouldn't be a problem if you were able to back out of a world and enter another one freely, but that just isn't the case. Another thing I wasn't keen on was saving. You can only save when Candy Kong becomes available with the save barrel for that world, and like Funky, she isn't always available until really inconvenient points. And this is one of those games where if you get a game over, you're back to the tile screen and have to redo everything that wasn't saved. And considering this game can turn it up when you least expect it to, the chances of that happening are higher than you might expect. Granted, I'm not as sour on this because I'm playing this off the Switch online library, meaning I have access to suspend states to cut down time, but still, it would've been nice to have access to Candy and Funky sooner in Worlds than you do. And for one last thing I didn't like about this game, the bosses. Aside from the final battle with King K. Rule, which made a lot out of something really simple, and managed to be a fast-paced and tense fight, the rest of the lot are so easy that I was either able to beat them in 15 seconds, or I just got bored. Definitely not a fun way to close out each world. But in the face of my issues, I can easily see why so many people do treasure Donkey Kong Country. At the time, it accomplished a lot in terms of presentation and setting a new identity for DK on the market, and it's still a fun and satisfying platformer to play even today. I will absolutely respect it for the impact that it had, and I can come back to it for just a fun time in general. So, only way to go from here is up. After Rare's massive success with the first game, it naturally meant that a sequel had to come out somewhere down the line, and that somewhere turned out to be one year later. Pretty traditional for some platforming franchises at the time, but all that matters in the end is how everything turned out. And I'm not going to be there on the bush, or tell any stories, or do any blah blah blah, blah blue about anything else, because Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, absolutely kicks the original out of the park and straight into the moon that DK punched into returns! For as much of a test Rare had on their hands, they did everything a good sequel to a fondly remembered first one should do. It ups the atmosphere, it ups the level design, it ups the bonuses, it ups the challenge, it ups the presentation as well! Everything was taken to the next level. 
Okay, maybe not the story is just slap the Kremlings again, but because they went as far as the kidnapping DK himself, having Diddy Kong and newcomer Dixie Kong be the protagonist does add a new sense of danger not present before. And besides, having these two instead does make for an all new experience. Diddy is similar to before, but Dixie can have her using her ponytail, and both can actually grab and throw each other to potentially get a much tougher enemy, or find something you couldn't get to with the base abilities of each Kong. This brings me to how the level design was one-upped. With the new location on Crocodile Island, any returning ideas from the first game have been modified to be even more interesting than before, along with some brand new themes that really make the adventure all its own. The greater emphasis on verticality in several levels does increase the variety and possibilities for sophisticated puzzles. There's plenty of bananas and extra lives to get, but there's also banana coins which are currency for first time fast travel, repeated saves at the Kong College, and Swing Kong's quiz show which can reward you with extra lives, and the DK tokens which are just there for completionist's sake. This leaves more room for exploration, and thankfully, they decrease the amount of cryptic bonus rooms while having more clever ones, which leave cell clues and good eye moments and are much more rewarding to find. Beating their challenges also now rewards you with Krem Coins, which can be used to access hidden levels in a secret world, which is a much better incentive to find them and reach their completion quota. Actually rewarding completion efforts with more game is something I always love. It's still a little hard to keep track of bonus room progress with only the exclamation mark, but since they're more cleverly laid out overall, and levels rarely have more than two or three bonus rooms, it's easier to swallow. The game also continues the trend of having each level feel distinct from one another through some method, and they can range from being welcome, to adding an extra layer to the playstyle you might be familiar with, to throwing something completely new at you, which is most apparent when they give you an animal buddy. These are much more fun than before. Rambi, Unguarde, and Squawks return, but the former two got new moves that make them more fun. For example, the distances you can get with Rambi feel almost criminal at points. The latter, however, got completely reworked into a flyer with pellets for ammo. Out of his mouth. Parrot machine gun. But there's plenty of new ones to go along with them. There are a couple relegated to stage gimmicks, like Clapper freezing water, Quawks only acting like a parachute, and Glimmer being DKC1 Squawks but underwater. But Bradley is basically a pogo stick that can get you to super high areas, and Squitter, easily my favorite animal buddy, can shoot webs in rapid succession like a machine gun. But the real fun comes with this other webs that you can use as makeshift platforms. Whenever Squitter shows up, I'm always happy to do this and find whatever I can, which is definitely encouraged. I'm pretty sure they were proud with what they did with the animal buddies here, because while their exclusive bonus rooms and the animal tokens by proxy have been removed, we get exclusive levels instead, which are really cool additions to the variety we have. The game is definitely challenging, make no mistake, but I'm really happy it's the kind of difficulty that eases you in perfectly well before testing you, and saving is so much more convenient. Weekly Clones College is almost placed really close to the start of each world, so unless you get reckless with how many levels you tackled, you shouldn't have to repeat that much progress if you get a game over. Funky is also not far from the start as well, so his fast travel is much more handy as well. Bosses are also miles better than previously. They test you in ways that are far more involved than just jump on them until they die, and they remain constantly invigorating and fun, and it feels good to figure out their patterns and overcome them. Easy shoutouts go to Cleaver, who is memorable in concept and implements a little vertical advantage, Creepy Crow, who did everything great about the first Crow fight, only better, and the first fight with Captain K. Rule, who has challenges of all kinds thrown at you, like ways to hit your movement, to even status ailments. They've definitely stepped up their game, just as much as they stepped up the presentation. Crocodile Island has these foreboding and vast atmospheres, yet it also has this odd sense of beauty at the same time, which I found very noticeable with the Bramble levels. I also love this game's set of sprites and just how lively and animated they can truly be, with my favorite examples being Diddy jamming to a beatbox and Dixie jamming to a guitar every time they get an item from an end level bonus barrel or defeat a boss. And oh man, this soundtrack is fantastic! Stick. There's so many catchy beats to find here, and the atmospheric pieces are just as beautiful as they are easy to remember. Some of my favorites easily have to go to Sneaky Chanty, Sticker Brush Symphony, In a Snowbound Land, Mighty Melancholy, Lockjaw Saga, Boss Bossa Nova, Crocodile Cacophony, I even love the jingle when you start the game up. That jingle! I think you probably won't pay attention to it while booting the game up again and again, but it's all proof that when David Wise touches any kind of musical instrument, magic is about to happen. And really? Magic really did happen here. Aside from the end boss of the secret levels being a letdown, and Squawk's controls being a little bit on the imprecise side, I really can't think of too many downsides with Donkey Kong Country 2. Rare truly stepped up their game from last time, and the end result is an experience I think anyone who likes video games, or likes Nintendo, should absolutely check out. I easily see why so many people consider it their favorite game in the series. For me, I think I'll need a moment to think about whether I like it more than Tropical Freeze which has loads of things I adore about too. But if I need to think about that, that means Donkey Kong Country 2 is an absolute keeper. So if you have the chance to play this game, 
absolutely take it. You'll definitely see what makes this adventure so special. So after I had a wonderful time with DKC2, I wasn't sure what I was going to think of Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble heading into it. All I heard about this one prior was that while it was good, the previous two were better, and the game wasn't hooking me as much as I was looking at video footage of it. That, and looking at its release date, which was November of 1996, I could tell that it had one thing weight out of its favor in terms of marketing. The fact that by that time, the Nintendo 64 was out for a month and a half, and we're still on the Super Nintendo. That means people were busy messing around with the N64 to really notice, even Wrigley was. Also, the fact that this game has a rendition of Peach's Castle from Mario 64 potentially playing on the same menu is some meta humor, I'll say that. So with this essentially being an installment doing its own thing, and being rare swan song to the SNES before they moved on to the N64 themselves, where does that leave us with this final romp? With a pretty good game. Compared to the other two though, I feel it's a step back, but as a Donkey Kong game in general, it gets the job done. Going off of how enjoyable Dixie Kong was last time, I overall don't mind her taking up the head mantle this time, and her playstyle remains perfectly intact. And then there's Kitty Kong, who I will admit I'm not super keen on his design, but he does have his uses, like being able to defeat stronger enemies, and being able to skip across water. I also do like how much more nuance they gave the team-up throw, as Kitty throwing Dixie yields greater height, while Dixie throwing Kitty may not lead that far, but his weight can break through certain spots which I appreciate. The Northern Crimisphere is designed much more like an open map, meaning there's an overall greater feeling of adventure here, helped up by the access of transfer vehicles that get you farther in, the more of them you get. And I'm happy to report that this game does help you keep a completion log. It still doesn't tell you where the bonus rooms or the return DK coins are, but the height of the pink and blue flags and the yellow flag's presence indicate if you've gotten everything in that level, so it's much easier to keep track in case you miss something. Though this might be apparent because there are plenty of bonus rooms that honestly just feel random to discover. Great that I wouldn't say that cryptic and random bonus rooms are the norm, I even found most of the content on my own, but there are quite a few where I just say, how was I supposed to figure that out? And others where I just say, um, okay. I tend to notice it more because I think the level design is a step back from previously. I can appreciate the increase in puzzle variety and putting a new spin on some attributes of DKC2's levels, not to mention there were plenty of gimmicks and challenges that felt good to overcome. I found myself having the most fun with this low gravity level, a time to control Squitter from last time, and this chase sequence, running away from a giant saw. I think we know where they got the idea for Sawmill Thrill and Tropical Freeze. But then you get some that just don't work. My least favorite is definitely Poisonous Pipeline, which completely inverts your horizontal swimming controls, but not your vertical ones. That probably doesn't sound like much, but it has a much larger impact on how you are playing water levels as of this point, and I don't mean that in a good way. My footage can only do so much, it feels that unnatural. I'm also not that huge on this water level where you have to keep this fish full so he doesn't eat you, despite the cool concept. The barrels in this level have these weird hitboxes making you fall a lot, and this rocket controls badly. While on a few of those, the animal buddies aren't as fun to use here. I mean, I do enjoy Squitter and Unguarde, and Ellie the Elephant can be fun, sometimes. Squawks is okay, Crocs I have almost nothing to say about, and Perry's collectible fodder, provided he doesn't die quickly, which he can very easily. And speaking of steps back, the bosses. They're not very good. They have some decent ideas, but the game is super choosy on whether or not you'll actually damage them, but not much else is going on in these fights, so there really isn't much to be interested in. Even K. Rool's fight is underwhelming. Okay, the Mad Scientist getup is cool, but again, he doesn't do a whole lot aside from change the field a bit. Also, in the first fight, I got this visual glitch where the back layer of the sprites moved, where the main background did not, and the electricity failed to load. Actually, there's a little more jank present here. There's plenty of times where I was hit by something I wasn't even close to, and times where these coins were definitely hit by a steel barrel, but nothing happened. And then there's this level where the upward line of barrels failed to load for this part, and the switch needed to change them loaded incorrectly. Like, what? I played this on the Switch online service, so what's going on here? Well, I will say that this is one reason I don't think the presentation holds up as well. I mean, the game still looks great, and there are a number of environments that are really pretty, but there's not as much detail flowing out of them. Dixie and Kitty are not that expressive, Kitty's definitely planning something nasty, and in terms of the sprites, most enemies have definitely seen better days. Can't say it was big on the music either. It's a good soundtrack, but everything just feels too mellow and soft, and the beats just don't pick up the slack, and what's left is music that's just not very memorable. There's no pieces that are ear-grating, but I will say there are a select few that do sound a little off-key. 
Alright, I know I went off quite a bit on things I don't like about this game, but rest assured, I don't dislike the game overall. I actually think it's totally fine. It's mechanically sound, there's plenty of things I enjoy discovering, and the adventurous feel does give it a little bit of an edge. I do admire how much Rare was willing to make it stand out on its own merits, rather than just try to one-up the last two games. It's definitely an experiment that overall did end well, but there are many areas where it could have been better, and most things I like about it are in the other two games. There's definitely merit to trying out Donkey Kong Country 3, especially if you want to see what else lies within the series. But if a spectacular platformer is what you want, then I have double the trouble recommending this one for that reason. Well, that was certainly bananas, but going back to the original question, have these games held up after all this time? Of course they have! And do I recommend them? Absolutely! They are still tightly designed platformers that do a great job of warring your sense of curiosity and challenging you with what you know about platformers, and the impact they had on the genre and on Rare as a company are definitely worthy of praise. If you enjoy platformers and are looking for something a little more old school, or you just want to see what the DK series has to offer, beyond what the modern day offers at the front, I'm sure you'll find something to enjoy here. I definitely had fun playing the original, and despite three steps back, it's still a good time regardless, but I implore you to play too, as it really is the total package when it comes to all the positives about the trilogy. So give these games a shot, through the Switch Online service, the GBA versions, or some other method you could find. Happy 40th birthday, DK! May your next trek be one for the books! I am the Lightning Ripper, and thank you for watching.